れってウルトラマンこの街は新宿だ What's up, everybody? I am the Kaiju no Kami, and today I'm taking a look at Mill Creek's recent DVD release of Ultraman Nexus. Ultraman Nexus has a really interesting history thanks to world events, network ineptitude, and being a financial failure. The concepts behind Nexus got their start in 2000 as head writer Keiichi Hasegawa was working on an anime adaptation of Devilman Lady. Unfortunately, due to various events, such as 9-11 here in the US, the plans for this Ultra series was put on hiatus until Tsuburaya announced a brand new string of Ultra shows under the banner Project N. This included a theatrical film titled Ultraman the Next that would serve as an introduction to the Ultraman world of the next show and lead into the series itself. Delays caused the next to end up being released after the series had already premiered, working as a prequel film instead. The basic idea was to create a new Ultra series that was geared towards the adult audience and have more mature themes and stories. The idea sounded great, however, due to bad press such as an increased use of CGI and adult aspects instantly turned people off who just wanted another run-of-the-mill Ultra series. The CGI part boggles my mind given its excessive use in the previous series, Ultraman Cosmos. Add on top, the television network decided they wanted Gundam Seed Destiny to be in the primetime slot Nexus was supposed to go in, moving Nexus to a children's morning time slot, and you have the makings of a major disaster. Just another reason to hate Gundam Seed Destiny. What we had was another Ultraman Taro situation where nobody was happy. Adults didn't watch the show due to its morning time slot, while kids found it to be boring because it was too serious for them on top of not being a merchandise machine. Thanks to these follies, the show changed its tone two thirds of the way through before being prematurely cancelled, leaving us with a rushed mess of an ending. Uh oh, this story is starting to sound like another toku series I'm familiar with. Is Ultraman Nexus a good time? Enjoyable? A worthy spot in the Ultra franchise? Or were audiences justified in not watching this one? Let's find out. The Heroes Similarly to Kamen Rider Kabuto, our main protagonist is not the lead hero. At least for the most part. The first two thirds of the series focuses on one Kazuki Komon, played by Takuji Kawakubo. <laughs> Komon kicks Nexus off in a rescue force. During a helicopter rescue operation, he started to have flashbacks of a time when he nearly drowned as a child, which caused one of his cohorts to save him and the person in danger. Komon is sent to a facility for a rigorous physical, which opens him up to joining a secret military organization called Terrestrial Liberation Trust, or TILT for short. Tilt's job is to kill alien creatures, space beasts, that come to Earth with as little people knowing about it as possible. Those who do witness these monsters are then required to have their memory wiped Men in Black style by a division of Tilt called the Memory Police. Komon is assigned to be a soldier in Tilt's main line of defense, the Night Raiders, whose sole purpose is eliminating the Space Beasts. The Night Raiders don blue and black uniforms with really big helmets that make me want to hear this song every time they scramble. One of the things I like about Komon is that he is not always willing to listen to orders if they contradict his personal beliefs. He already doesn't like the idea of people having their memories erased, but when children are involved, he will blatantly disobey orders if it will save the life of a child. Yeah. 
This will constantly get him into heated arguments with the Night Raiders vice captain, Nagi Saijo. Nagi's parents were killed 18 years prior to the show's events by a space beast, which grew an immense hatred for them in her heart. She will always prioritize the execution of any monster over anything else and will contest anyone that disagrees with this notion. This constantly causes friction between her and Komon as she tries to coerce Komon into her way of thinking. These beliefs were further enhanced by a former member of the team, a love interest of hers, who gave into the power of the space beast to become one himself. All of these lead to her automatically assuming Ultraman Nexus is an enemy of Earth despite his repeated battles against the vicious aliens. Garo fans should recognize actress Yasue Sato, for she portrayed Jabi there while also being used to motion capture the main protagonist in the Capcom horror game Haunting Ground. Back to Kamon, he goes through his own set of tragedies. His girlfriend, Riko Saida, is in constant peril due to her relationship with him. Komon and Rika met at a local zoo as he likes to reflect on what has happened to him while she constantly goes there to draw animal families for her college degree program. A chance meeting set these two on a love boat, of which was not as smooth as one would assume. Sadly, Rika's actress, Shion Nakamura, died last year. She was also featured in Kamen Rider Double and Ultra 7X. The remaining members of the Night Raiders include their captain, Aisuke Wakura, the weapons expert, Shiori Hiraki. And Mitsuhiko Ishibori, a scientific genius. They are all portrayed by Tomotsu Ishibashi, Keiko Goto, and Kosei Kato, all of whom have made appearances in other Ultra series. Wakura does have a couple of great moments in the show when he reveals his grief over their lost member, on top of his willingness to question orders that he feels are morally wrong at the tail end of the show. As for Shiori and Ishibori... Uh... They're kind of just... there. They don't really do much of anything and have little to no development. Apparently, all of Shiori's development is retained in a special episode that is not present on this DVD set, which shows her going from being a policewoman to a member of the Night Raiders, but Tsuburaya clearly deems it not important enough. Nevertheless, these two characters are very lackluster and something that occurs in the final episodes makes little to no sense. It's a real shame too, because there was plenty of time for the show to focus on them. Instead, the writers centralized on some new characters during the last third I didn't give a damn about. You're useless. The Night Raiders have to report to a tilt director named Yochiro Matsunaga and a homebred technical whiz who gives them their battle plans nicknamed Illustrator. Illustrator apparently already knew about the existence of Ultraman and is constantly studying him for various reasons. Masumi Hurauchi does a fantastic job as the asshole Matsunaga, who was the Freeze Roid Mutant Kamen Rider Drive, along with being a variety of characters in several Ultra shows, with his most recent one being a mayor in an episode of Ultraman Decker. The program has been completed. Illustrator is played by Nobuhiko Tanaka. Yatsu no Taiyaki wa 
チェスターベータとガンマによる同時攻撃を仕掛けてください The first interesting aspect to Nexus is its focus on Kamon as opposed to the man who is the titular hero The second is how Tilt remains hidden to the public which means the Night Raiders are required to operate as covertly as possible They can't just go running gunning down monsters in public spaces rather try to keep them refined to rural areas I also like how their vehicles deemed Chesters have cloaking technology within them to keep the ships away from public awareness Although, I really wanted to see what would happen if they had forgotten to cloak their ships. Finally, no one person takes up the mantle of Ultraman Nexus. Instead, the ability is passed around. The first Dunamist, as the host is referred to, to take on the form of Ultraman Nexus is former war photographer Jun Himeya. Hey, wait, does that mean that the universal greeting for an Ultraman is Do Namaste? Back to the review, June was injured while photographing a war somewhere in Southeast Asia and was nursed back to health by a young girl named Sarah. After recovering, June ran off to take pictures of a nearby battle, witnessing Sarah's death as she came chasing after him. He was shot in the leg, waking up to find himself in a strange forest with an ancient temple that housed a ship. The ship gave him the ability to transform into Nexus. Though, June questions why he was chosen to be the world's defender when he allowed a young girl to die for his selfishness. His guilt was developed even further as his photos won him awards around the world, which he felt was unethical to the people who died for his success. As such, he quit the photography business and set to defend the world from the space beast while trying to find the answers to his questions. While I didn't find Yusuke Kirishima to be the best actor on the show, he did give a solid performance overall and played June effectively well. I just would have liked to have seen a bit more emotion from a man who is supposedly haunted by the deeds of his past. The second Dynamis to take on the role of Nexus is a young boy boy named Ren Seiju. Ren is from a tilt facility in Dallas, Texas where children are made. <laughs> He decided to leave the place and come to Japan because it felt like that is where his calling was. When he arrived, he joined the crew of an amusement park and lives in a shack there. He used to be classmates with Illustrator and occasionally makes contact with him to discuss business. You can do it. I'll take my data. Ren. I'm sorry. Ren was chosen by the light to become Nexus because... That's what the script ordained. I can't say I like Ren one bit as I find him to be a complete downgrade from June on top of just being a Gary Stu character who is aware of everything going on around him being nonchalant about it all. I get being laid back and just going with the flow, but the way he is written here just bothers me. Funny enough, Ren is played by Masato Uchiyama who was the second the B in Punch Hopper and Kamen Rider Kabuto. <laughs> Ren does have a subplot with a young woman sent to befriend him by Tilt, named Mizuo Nonomiya. Mizuo is a new recruit to the memory police, and as such, is not very skillful at being discreet. She also prays every time she erases someone's memory. Outside of becoming a suitable love interest for Ren, she has little personality. Okay, that might not be fair, as Tomomoi Miyashita tries her hardest to give a solid performance. I just don't care about her character one bit because both her and Ren steal screen time away from the Night Raiders. As for Ultraman Nexus, both June and Ren start off with a basic silver form that is purposely made to look genderless due to anyone, man or woman, being able to take up the mantle of Nexus. In battle, Nexus can change his form, or her form, if there is a female Dunamist, based on who the Dunamist is. For June, Nexus takes on a red body while Ren's is a blue one. <laughs> Thank you.
Both of them have their own unique fighting style. June tends to fight on the defensive, Alternatively, Ren doesn't give a crap if he gets injured in the midst of battle. Both can transport their opponents to an altered dimension to avoid the general public from witnessing their battles on top of keeping real estate from constantly getting destroyed. This probably made the effects people quite happy because it meant they didn't have to constantly blow up buildings and then make new ones. Nexus does have a final form in the finale. <laughs> The Monsters and Aliens. For those of you that like centralized villains, you've got your wish as the Space Beasts kinda have a boss. It's actually kind of interesting that despite being 37 episodes, this show doesn't feature a lot of monsters and aliens. In fact, every monster pretty much is an alien, with evil Ultraman figures being the sole sentient antagonists. The big boss is an evil Nexus clone named Dark Zagi. <laughs> He's the true puppet master to everything going on behind the scenes and has been around since the first time aliens visited the world in the 1990s. His second in command is essentially the space beast the former Knight Raider Shinya Mozurogi took on in the form of Dark Mephisto. Mizurugi was Nagi's trainer and love interest until a mission turned Mizurugi to the dark side. Probably because they had cookies. Mizurugi then created his own puppet, Dark Faust. <laughs> Wait. Mephisto, Faust. I see where you're going with this. And apparently, the actual main bad guy of this show, had it not been cancelled, was going to be named Lucifer. You devils. You smart devils. To offset budget constraints, the writers gave the space beasts unique abilities such as regeneration or had them just be an entire race of creatures to be able to reuse the same beings over. This adds a level of intrigue because it allows the monsters to be featured in multiple episodes rather than being one and done. It also means they have a longevity and gave fans of the show even more reason to have toys of some of the coolest space beasts imaginable such as the Cerberus like Galbaros. Alien 3 Go Goloma The Spider Bompira To the rat looking Nosfira and the beast that encompasses them all into its design, Azamel. All of their designs are wicked creepy, leaving the impression that you never want to cross paths with any of them. The effects and music. Outside of some dodgy CGI battles, and I mean dodgy, the effects and music are quite good. Nexus taking his adversaries into an altered dimension allows for the use of weird color combinations you wouldn't normally see in the real world. The 
Those lighting can be exceptional, and the show features intense atmosphere from time to time. Color filters are used effectively well. There are a couple of really neat camera angles, with one of my favorites belonging to a sunset battle. <laughs> We do have a couple of CGI battles happening. Kenji Kawaii helmed Nexus's soundtrack and did a pretty good job of it despite it not featuring the best Ultraman music around. Kawaii has done music to an armada of anime franchises starting back in the 80s and 90s, with the likes of Devilman, Project Eiko, Rama 1 Half, Ghost in the Shell, to modern ones like Gundam Double Zero, When They Cry, and Fate Unlimited Blade Works. He also did the music to Ultraman Jeed, Akiba Ranger, and Kamen Rider Build on top of horror films like The Ring and Dark Water. With that in mind, there are a lot of tracks I enjoy joy such as these pieces. Riko. どうしたのかなって。だって僕のせいで君は辛い。でしょ。残る最後の一箇所。I am not exactly sure as to why, but every time I hear this one, I think of Godzilla Final Wars. There's also this effective one here that uses music as if it is some background noise. <laughs> Nexus does have two opening songs and for some odd reason, three closing ones. The only one that really does anything for me is the second closing. Tobita Tanai Watashi ni Anata ga Tsubasa o Kureta, sung by Uka Sugasa in Desbos. Wow, what a title and a name for the artist. Uka also did the first closing song, Itsumo Kokuro ni Tayo o. Toby to Tanai just hits the right sounds for me with its epic beginning. The final song is done by Rina Aichi. This one is titled Akaku Atsui Kodo and is rather bland. Then again, I can't say the two openings, sung by Doa, do much of anything else either. These are titled AU and Oi Kajitsu. As I have said in the past, Toei is king of the hill when it comes to toku openings and closings, and Nexus did nothing to prove me otherwise. The Episodes Ultraman Nexus takes a serialized approach to its story rather than the episodic nature the series before it had done. This allows the stories to flow fluidly into one another with many of the episodes being three to four parters. It also lets Tsuburaya keep a monster suit around for multiple episodes as I had mentioned a little bit ago. The more mature aspects of the first 25 episodes also helped enhance the show as the characters always felt like they could die at any moment even though they don't. This is the way a show about monsters should feel because it keeps you in a Anticipation for what is going to happen next like a horror movie. Ultraman is always at its best when it is doing horror based stories and this show was one giant horror show. Due to its serialized nature, it is hard to pick a favorite because no matter what, I am having to pick several episodes in one go. Nevertheless, I have chosen Darkness and Apocalypse to be my top dogs of the show. Both feature the origin story behind Mizurogi's betrayal. <laughs> There's the atmosphere. <laughs> the aforementioned Gabaros at the center of its horror. Good 
music. And answers to questions that have been building up for quite some time. Another aspect I enjoyed in the first 25 episodes was a subplot revolving around a former cohort of Junes that is trying to uncover the truth behind what exactly the government is hiding from the general public. It added another layer of intrigue to what was already an interesting premise. Regretfully, all of this is not to the wayside for the last 12 episodes of the show because, heaven forbid, it continued to cater to adults instead of the children who weren't watching the series anyway. Granted, not many adults were watching either, but again, that's all thanks to the idiots running the television network. Episode 26, The Third, is the episode I absolutely despise the most because of this. It introduces Ren, who steals the focus away from the Night Raiders. It's way too silly and feels out of place for an episode of Ultraman Nexus. <laughs> What the hell is that? Worst of all, it's just flat out monotonous. If you're going to throw a wrecking ball into your show's tone, at least don't let it be an utter bore to sit through. Supposedly, this tunnel shift was always planned, but I don't buy it. It's just too jarring to have been plotted that way, especially when there are several plot lines that are just dropped or forgotten about from the first 25 episodes. On the positive, at least Nexus retained its narrative side rather than becoming an episodic show for its last batch of episodes. The movie. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the review, Nexus had a pre film called Ultraman The Next. The Next is set in the year 2004, five years before Nexus, and features an Air Force pilot named Shinichi Maki becoming our titular hero after flying smack dab into a ball of fire on his last mission before retirement. Air Force pilot? Well now, the temptation is way too great. Oh man, I just thought of something. He was one day away from retirement and he, oh my god, how many 80s tropes does this guy encompass? So yeah, Shunichi was quitting the Air Force so he could be at home more often because his son is very sick and he no longer wants to leave his wife alone with him or anything ever to happen. Shunichi gets a job at an airplane tour guide business, which does have some interesting callbacks to Ultra Q. Unfortunately for Shinichi, his miraculous survival from the fireball makes him a target for a secret government division that believes he is now becoming a space beast, and they capture him to ensure he does not harm anyone, given that has already happened with another soldier who came across an alien being. That being ends up seeking out Shinichi, and we get Shinichi coming to terms with his newfound abilities, becoming the universe's first ever Ultraman. The villain, codenamed The One, is quite cool looking and I love how he evolves over the course of the film. He initially absorbs a multitude of lizards and become lizard-like, then rats, obtaining their features, to birds that give him the ability to fly. We do get a CGI battle at the end, but it is a pretty cool one despite looking dated. I can't say that this is the best Ultraman movie ever, as it is a little too dreary. Nevertheless, I did enjoy it for what it attempted to do, and it created a brand new universe that had an interesting take on the franchise. <laughs> The DVD. As you can see, it's your typical Mill Creek standard fare. You've got the cover, the spine, the backside. You have your discs for the series. 
and then we've got the movie the next and then we have the booklet with info on uh nexus the monsters and space beasts and all that and then the episodes and just because i wanted to include it here is the japanese disc for the next spine backside and then here's what the disc is like. Ignore the Shout Factory Ultra 7 book in there because that's not important. I can't say the video quality is exactly stellar, though it isn't atrocious looking either. I've seen much worse. It does suffer from some compression issues with pixelation and weird jacket oddities that occur around the outlines of the actors every now and then. There are also times when the video looks jittery. <laughs> Audio is superb all the way through with no distortions I can recall. As for the subtitles, they're kind of bad. The songs are not subbed in the slightest while the grammar used is all over the place in quality. There are several lines that seemed like they were given a quick translation, but then the translation was never proofread to make sure it made sense. There's even one case where lines are missing, and I mean that quite literally, as there was one episode where the subtitles read, line missing, despite there being no dialogue spoken at that time. What's even more frustrating is the majority of the time, the subtitles would disappear before a character has finished their full sentence, leaving you pondering if they had translated the whole sentence in the last line or forgot to translate a new one. The subtitles for the next are a new translation compared to what the Region 2 DVD from 2005 entailed. They're still not perfect, sometimes a bit wordy, and move on screen a little too fast every now and then. Regardless, I'm glad they didn't reuse those awful ones from before. Video quality appeared to be a slight improvement over the Japanese disc. Audio was inferior, being a 2.0 track instead of 5.1. Ultraman Nexus is the Kamen Rider Hibiki of Ultraman. The first two thirds were amazing and broke the mold, while the last third was a complete botch job full of characters I didn't give a damn about and a final episode that made no sense. Thus, I sadly have to give Ultraman Nexus a three out of five grown-ups in spandex. It's a shame because this show was on track for greatness. It could have been one of the greatest Ultraman series ever made, if not the greatest. But instead, they decided to cater towards an audience that just didn't give a damn about it. With that said, thank you as always for watching my reviews. And because I am in need of ad revenue, please watch this review again for the first time. This is What's up everybody, I am the Kaiju no Kami, and today I'm taking a look at Mill Creek's recent DVD release of Ultraman Nexus. <laughs> 